Thank you, Judge. Thank you, everyone. Uh, rather than give a, uh, a broad overview uh, of the Murphy litigation, which, which I think probably many folks in this room uh, are well versed in, uh, I want to focus my talk today on a, uh, a singular issue that has, has been at the center uh, of the, the legal debates uh, throughout the history of this case. And uh, as we went to the Supreme Court, emerged as uh, what looks like it could be a, a pivotal tipping issue for the court. Um, and uh, like any issue in Indian law that ends up in the Supreme Court, uh, it has a, a, a pivotal tipping posture with the court. Uh, the answer and, and uh, or the beginning place to look for answers is in, uh, is in the history. And so that's uh, where I would begin. Uh, one of the, the downsides of following a speaker like Stephanie Hudson is her, uh, is her knowledge and, and, and dynamic energy. But the, one of the benefits here is she, she covered a lot of the important history uh, of, the, of the establishment of the Creek Reservation. So I'm going to just touch on it very briefly and, and uh, allow us to uh, recall what she said. Um, the Creek Reservation, as, as we all know, was, was uh, the Creek started out in the east, uh, came west on the Trail of Tears. Uh, in the 1830s, uh, the re reservation was established by treaty, uh, and, and they arrived in 1836, and their first real governing act was to, uh, was to found the town of Tulsa. Um, and uh, and that, the, the important part of that, uh, of that for our story is that uh, the Creek Reservation was established by a treaty. By, established by Congress. Hold that thought. Uh, 1866, the treaty, the, the reservation was uh, cut in half by Congress, uh, and the reservation that, that resulted from the 1866 treaty uh, is the reservation boundaries that are at issue today in the court. Uh, and the two, the two uh, events that are most important uh, to the to the Murphy case, right as it stands right now. Uh, are what happened in 1901 and 1906. Uh, and as Ms. Hudson outlined uh, so eloquently, uh, in 1901 they allotted, uh, the uh, Creeks was in 1901, they allotted the five tribes reservations uh, in the years surrounding the turn of the century. Um, and the important point uh, for the Murphy litigation was that the Creek allotment statute um, not only provided an allotment or, or assigned an allotment to each individual member, they provided that the tribe would be terminated in 1906. And if you're going to terminate the tribe by 1906, the reservation goes away. Because without a, without a tribe uh, to exercise sovereignty over it, uh, the concept of a reservation makes, makes little sense. Um, so that's 19, 1901. Uh, in 1906, Congress passed an act called the Five Tribes Act, and it changed its mind. In 1906, Congress came along and said, you know, there's a lot of administrative, legal, uh, and, and other reasons why we just can't go through this right now. Not all of them were benign reasons for the tribe, um, but there were compelling reasons Congress simply said, we can't do it. In 1906, it enacted a statute that said uh, the, the tribal governments of the five tribes paraphrasing here, are preserved indefinitely for all purposes authorized by law. So 1901, they said, you're doomed. 1906, they said, we'll take that back. In the meantime, uh, also in 1901, in a very uh, uh, important part of the story, uh, is, is uh, oil was discovered on the reservation. The first discovery of oil uh, in, in Oklahoma was on the Creek Reservation in 1901. Uh, and that was the dawn then of, uh, of Oklahoma's oil. So what you had in, in that, one, that, that narrow period of years uh, was suddenly what had been a massive block of tribally, uh, uh, tribally governed land was now uh, separated into allotments. Each of those allotments was either a fairly middling piece of farmland, 
or a world-class fortune. It might be sitting on an oil or an oil deposit or pool. I don't know the terminology. Um, but that's where it stood upon a lot. Those two events converged uh, in a very potent, uh, a very potent way, as as uh, Secretary of the Interior Carl Schurz said in uh, very prophetically in 1881, "There's nothing more dangerous to an Indian reservation than Ridge Mine," uh, and that's where the five tribes sat after a lot at the turn of the century. Uh, now, the ordinary course of history in the West, in the Midwest. Uh, when Indian lands were allotted, there was, of course, as we all know, a great deal of pressure um, for interest who wanted that land to farm, for settlement and farming. But in this case, uh, that pressure was, was orders of magnitude more intense because there was fortune underneath the, oil, uh, underneath the ground. Uh, and no one knew where it was, so every allotment had the potential uh, for a jackpot. Uh, and, and, and as it happened, uh, speculators, land agents, um, lawyers, uh, uh, federal Indian agents, everybody began speculating in Indian land and trying to, uh, through various, you know, by hook and crook, through various ways, forge deeds, fraud, uh, and even theft and violence to dispossess uh, these newly allotted Indians of their lands. And as, uh, Historian Angie Debo uh, very um, uh, poetically, unfortunately, put it: uh, it amounted to an orgy of plunder and exploitation, probably unparalleled in American history. Within a generation, these Indians were stripped of their holdings and were rescued from starvation only through public charity. So, as a result, uh, and, and make no mistake about it, they were run off their lands. Um, economically, culturally, governmentally, spiritually, uh, it was it was a body blow to the tribes. Uh, and at this time, another another convergence of history, right in the midst of this of this um, cataclysm, uh, Congress granted statehood to the state of Oklahoma, and that was 1907. Now remember, uh, in 1901 and 1906. Congress had reached for termination and then it reached back and it preserved the tribes. So it did not terminate the tribes or their reservations in those statutes. And nevertheless, Oklahoma acted as though it did. Oklahoma immediately, uh, Oklahoma courts began asserting jurisdiction uh, over the five tribes and their members um, and their lands. And in large part, because they were in such a state of social uh, uh, devastation, the tribes acquiesced, not entirely, but in large part. Um, and that continued um, throughout the 20th century. Uh, throughout the 20th century, Oklahoma continued to assert uh, an act as though it had, uh, in, in most cases, plenary jurisdiction over the, over the reservations, uh, including in 1999, uh, when a Creek uh, member um, Patrick Murphy, a murdered a Creek member, uh, George Jacobs, on a, on a plot of land uh, outside of Henrietta. Um, and he was um, uh, tried and, and convicted uh, by the state courts of Oklahoma and sentenced to death. Uh, Mr. Murphy filed in 2005, I believe it was, a, a federal habeas action in the Eastern District of Oklahoma claiming that um, Actually, the state of, of Oklahoma had no jurisdiction over me because I'm an Indian, uh, and this is an Indian reservation. Congress never disestablished this reservation. And when you go into federal court uh, and make an argument like that, uh, the case that you begin with is Solomon v. Bartlett, uh, the Supreme Court's half-marking um, uh, reservation disestablishment claim uh, case in 1984. Uh, and that involved uh, whether the Cheyenne River uh, Sioux Reservation in South Dakota had been disestablished. And what the court said in Solomon was this. The first and governing principle is that only Congress can divest a reservation of its boundaries. A reservation retains its status until Congress explicitly indicates otherwise. 
Congress must clearly evince an intent to change boundaries. It can't be the Secretary of the Interior, it can't be land speculators or settlers uh, or state courts, state governments, anybody else. Only Congress, as Ms. As, uh, Ms. Hudson said, uh, the Lone Wolf case established that Congress could do that. But as Solomon makes clear, only Congress can do that. Uh, however, uh, because uh, Congress in that era was not always crystal clear uh, in terms of, of how it spoke about uh, uh, reservations in, in its statutory language, uh, the court developed a three-part test, the solemn test, for determining uh, when Congress has actually disestablished a reservation or, or whether it has not. And the three-part solemn test uh, begins with, because we're, we're talking about what Congress did, begins with the statutory text. Um, and that's the most probative, primary evidence of, of whether Congress terminated a reservation or not. If the text is unclear, the court may proceed to step two. Uh, and step two asks, what were the circumstances of this statute? Um, and, and what it asks is, the actors close in time to this is to this statute what were they are what was their understanding what was Congress's understanding what did the tribes understand what did the Secretary of the Interior understand what did the Indian agents understand um, this statute would, would accomplish um, and if the evidence is unequivocal that they all said yes this this reservation is going to be disestablished then a court can find disestablishment at step two but it has to be unequivocal because we're departing a little bit from the text here. Um, and, 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 and because only Congress can do it, you have to have that tether, that tie to Congress's intent. Um, but courts may also, at step three, uh, and this is uh, getting to the heart of, of what's at issue in Murphy, um, courts may also look to what happened after the statute uh, was enacted. And I'm talking about statutes that would have opened the reservation to non-Indian settlers or, or allotment acts or what have you. Uh, and what they look to in step three is what was the jurisdictional history, what was the demographic history after allotment or the opening of the reservation. Did the state assume jurisdiction? Did the Indians object? Uh, did the area suddenly uh, take on um, non-Indian character? And if you apply that to the Creek situation, step one, step two, step three, uh, the Creek situation looks pretty favorable to step one, uh, because Congress in 1906 said, we're not doing this. Uh, we're going to preserve the Indians for, for, for all purposes authorized by law, or pr preserve the tribes. Step two, um, you had a, a, a Congress wanting to terminate in 1901 and then changing its mind in 1906. So there's a lot of evidence that's mixed. You have statements definitely saying uh, you're going to be terminated, and other statements saying that, no, we're not. So it's equivocal. So under the solemn test, um, if, if, the, if the step two evidence has to be unequivocal, we're good there too. So step one and step two. Um, look fairly favorable to the Creek Nation. Uh, but what about step three, the jurisdictional history and, and the demographic changes? The jurisdictional history was an overwhelming assumption of history by, uh, of jurisdiction by the state. Uh, and we know there was a significant uh, increase in non-Indian demographic character of the five tribes, uh, land ownership and, and, and residents and population uh, in the years after allotment. So the question uh, is, what kind of weight do you place on step three? What kind of weight? And what the court said was uh, this, this after math evidence, you know, what the state did, where the Indians run off their land, that's an unorthodox and potentially unreliable method of statutory interpretation. It is thus merely one additional clue to what Congress expected. And here's the key of the solid test. If this establishment is not found in steps one and two, courts are bound to rule that the reservation boundaries survive. It can't go to step three. Uh, so again, if this is the test for the Greek reservation, um, it, it is uh, 
there's reason for optimism. However, uh, there were several Supreme Court uh, decisions applying the Sodom test in subsequent years, and what we see is that step three, the looking at the aftermath, began to evolve. In 1994, in Hagen v. Utah, involving the uh, uh, Utah Reservation, uh, the court looked at step three. Uh, state juris the state had assumed jurisdiction. A non-Indian population uh, dominated after the statute. And the court said, well, uh, this constitutes a practical acknowledgment that the reservation was diminished. And listen to this. A contrary conclusion would seriously disrupt the justifiable expectations of the people living in the area. Now that's new, that's not from Solomon. Now Solomon talks about what did Congress intend, what did Congress expect? And now Hagen was looking at people in the 1990s saying, what did they expect? So it's a new twist on the Solomon test. It's a softening of, of, the, of, the, of the focus on step one and step two and an expansion of that, of that, third, uh, that third component. Uh, in South Dakota uh, versus Yankton Sioux Tribe in 1998, uh, the court at, at step three recounted again the, 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 over, uh, the, the overwhelming uh, non-Indian character of the reservation on the fact that the state had assumed jurisdiction. Um, and, and again, and it's that those demographics signify a diminished reservation. Again, this is stronger than Solomon stated. However, those two cases kept the hierarchy. Step one and step two are the most important. The statute and the surrounding circumstances of the statute. Uh, and, and step three is, is far less important. In fact, Yankton Sue said, step three evidence is the least compelling. It said that for a very logical reason. Every statute that opened up a reservation to settlement involved an influx of settlement. Every statute that did that, uh, there was a change in demographics and land ownership. So how much can you really um, uh, glean from that factor? Uh, so they, 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 they at least correctly, even if they, they gave it more importance than some of them, they kept a hierarchy in place. Step one, step two, step three. Then in 2005, um, a case reached the Supreme Court involving uh, the Oneida Indian Nation, a case was called City of Sherrill versus Oneida Indian Nation of New York. It was not a disestablishment case, but, case, but it had a lot of parallels. Uh, there, the, the Oneidas had lost their reservation in the early 1800s. And they weren't claiming that their reservation still survived. What they did was they bought a couple of parcels of land in the city of Sherrill, and they said, since this was our reservation, we now own this land. This is now our sovereign territory, and the city of Sherrill cannot tax us. And in a decision, a uh, unanimous decision of the court, written by Justice Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg said, reestablishment of Indian sovereignty would have disruptive practical consequences for those living there today. The long-standing assumption of jurisdiction by the state over a 90% non-Indian area may create, and this is language from Hagen, justifiable expectations, which merry, merry heavy weight here. And, and she cited Hagen. Now Hagen said justifiable expectations, but it said nothing about meriting heavy weight. That is also, uh, that, that's new. Um, Again, in, under the Solemn Test, that's the least important. And Justice Ginsburg just said it merits heavy weight. In fact, what she said was long acquiescence by a tribe to state authority may have controlling effect. That really flips the Solemn Test on its head because it says, I don't care what Congress said. If the Indians didn't object to this, to this assumption of state jurisdiction, that's controlling. The reservation is gone. We are not looking at what Congress did. It's a profound concept, uh, and especially if it were to be applied in a disestablishment case. And, and what happened after Cheryl is, is lower courts took that as an invitation to drift from step one and step two towards step three. Uh, 
uh, and, and they began uh, a more looser analysis of the asylum tests, less attention to the text, less attention to the surrounding circumstances, and more attention to step three aftermath factors, which if you're an Indian tribe with an understanding of your history, you know that's bad news, because uh, we all know what happened to those uh, reservations. Now, one of those cases that, that applied that uh, uh, the Cheryl concept was Mr. Burgess in, uh, in his Eastern District of Oklahoma case. Uh, he brought that there on habeas and saying, this is a reservation. Uh, the court did not even bother going through the solid test. The Eastern District of Oklahoma cut right to step three, he cut right to Cheryl and said, there's no question based on the history of the Creek Nation, that Indian reservations do not exist in Oklahoma. State laws have applied over the lands within the historical boundaries of the Creek Nation for over 100 years. The justifiable expectations of the people living in the area are proper considerations in determining Indian issues. Citing, not Solomon, not Hagen, not Yankton Sioux, not anyone else, Cheryl. Uh, and so Mr. Murphy was onward to the Tenth Circuit. But before he got there, uh, the Tenth Circuit was faced with a disestablishment case uh, with respect to the Osage Reservation. And the Tenth Circuit at least did go through the three-step motions of the solemn test. At step one, it found uh, the Osage Allotment Act. There's no language uh, of, of disestablishment. Then proceeded to step two. However, at step two, you can see this is an example of the lower courts loosening the solemn standard. It made no mention uh, that the evidence there had to be unequivocal or even contemporary. Instead of looking at what Congress thought, what the Indians thought, step two, one of the things the Osage Nation Court looked at was what modern day historians thought. Historian Lawrence Kelly concludes that treaties and articles in professional journals consider the Osage reservation disestablished. Now there, you're very, very, very far from Solomon. You're very far from what the Congress, the 56th Congress thought in 1901. Uh, and most telling was uh, the Osage Nation's uh, decision, or, or analysis of step three. The population demographics have dramatically shifted in the second bullet there. Land ownership has also dramatically shifted. These factors create justifiable expectations of the non-Indians who live there today that merit heavy weight. Citing, not solid, shell. In fact, the court said that our decision must reflect the modern day balance of the area demographics. Again, uh, that is far afield uh, of this focus on Congress, Congress, Congress that Solomon established. Mr. Murphy now uh, was heading to the Tenth Circuit uh, with that very circuit having decided uh, that kind of case and, and prospects looked bleak. But before he got there, uh, a case regarding the Omaha Reservation in Nebraska reached the Supreme Court. Uh, in that case, it was Nebraska v. Parker. Uh, in 2000, it was decided in 2016. Uh, and, and, and in Nebraska v. Parker, the court went through the solemn test. Step one, step two, step three. At step one, it found there was no uh, uh, language in the 1872 statute and issue there uh, disestablishing the Omaha Reservation. The surrounding circumstances were mixed. There was lots of evidence suggesting that everyone thought the reservation was going to be disestablished. But there was some that suggested it wasn't going to be disestablished. It was mixed. And what the court said was, oh, we're going to weigh this evidence. Because it's mixed evidence, uh, it fails the test of having to be unequivocal. And so uh, advantage to the tribe at step two. However, at step three, uh, here is the description of what, what the court described the step three factors as. The tribe was almost entirely absent from the area for almost 120 years. 
no activity, no tribal presence whatsoever. For more than a century, federal government officials treated the disputed land as Nebraska's. And of course, Nebraska had assumed full jurisdiction over the area. Land ownership swung almost 100% non-Indian. Uh, the racial demographics swung almost 100% non-Indian. Yet, yet, this is what the court said at step three. Subsequent demographic history, step three, cannot overcome our conclusion in steps one and step two that Congress did not intend to diminish the reservation. It's not our role to rewrite the statute based on what happened after. As to the Cheryl question, the settled expectations of, of modern day uh, uh, inhabitants of the area, concerns about upsetting the justifiable expectations of the almost exclusively non-Indian settlers who live on the land cannot diminish reservation boundaries. Back to Solomon, only Congress has the power to diminish a reservation. So what, what Parker did is it wrenched the doctrine uh, from, from where it had been drifting towards Cheryl and it wrenched it back to Solomon and said this is about Congress. It's not about the history of, of these reservations getting overrun and, and non-Indian uh, uh, or the, the Indian character becoming degraded. Uh, it's about Congress's intent. So Mr. Murphy was now headed to this 10th Circuit, uh, not with the specter of Osage Nation looming behind him, uh, but with Nebraska v. Parker, with, with wind at his back. Um, and What we did, what Philip and I did, when we crafted uh, the brief in the Tenth Circuit on behalf of the Creek Nation, I should add that at that point, uh, the Creek Nation entered the case as an amicus in favor of Mr. Murphy. Uh, and I think we probably cited Parker a hundred times in that brief. Uh, it was Congress, 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 Parker, Parker, Parker. Um, and what we said was, what you did there, Tenth Circuit, no Sage Nation, you can't do that here. The law has changed, or at least the law has been clarified, see Parker. Um, and that's what the court did. That, that's what the Tenth Circuit did. It found that step one, it looked at the 1901 and the 1906 statute, and it said, yep, Congress thought about it, but Congress didn't do it. Uh, at step two, the evidence was mixed, because we had the 1901 evidence where everyone's talking about termination, but then we have the 1906 evidence where, where, where members of Congress are saying, hey, well, we actually can't do this. And the court said that the evidence at step two is at most debatable. So we need not parse it further. So again, it's not weighing the evidence. It's that you have to be unequivocal. You're not unequivocal. Try to at step two. Uh, and though, even though at step three, because of what happened after a lot of year, the step three evidence um, you know, could be viewed by many courts as absolutely overwhelming in favor of disestablishment. You know, everyone looks back at that and says, well, there was allotment, and then, you know, within 10, you know, a few years, the reservations were gone. Uh, so step three, it could have been overwhelming. But what the court did in, in, in Murphy, the Tenth Circuit did in Murphy, uh, was absolutely adhere to the solemn principle. When steps one and two fail to provide substantial and compelling evidence, of Congress's intent, courts must conclude that the old reservation boundaries remain intact, saying Solomon. Such is the case here. So if, if Parker was a course correction, it was a signal by the Supreme Court to lower courts that says, get back to Solomon. Uh, Murphy, which was the first federal court to, to hear this establishment case, to my knowledge, after Solomon, uh, the message of Murphy was, uh, we hear you loud and clear, Supreme Court. Um, they did exactly what Parker required. Um, however, however, uh, the state of Oklahoma petitioned for en banc review, asking the whole court, instead of just this panel of three judges, asking the whole court to, uh, to, 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 re to relook at it. And, uh, and the court, declined to do so, saying the law is the law. Parker is, says what it says. Uh, 
Judge Tinkovich, however, in that in the decision denying a bond review, issued a concurrence. And what Judge Tinkovich said was, in fact, this case might benefit from further attention by the Supreme Court. The Creek Reservation encompasses a substantial non-Indian population, including much of the city of Tulsa. This could have dramatic consequences for taxation, regulation, and law enforcement. The panel faithfully applied Supreme Court precedent, holding that such demographic evidence cannot overcome the absence of statutory text. But this may be the case where the Supreme Court wishes to revisit Solemn if it can be persuaded that the square peg of Solemn is ill-suited for the round hole of Oklahoma. So what, the, what Judge Tinkovich there is saying is, yeah, our hands were tied. The law is the law. But we think this is a case where you should ditch the Solemn test and go right to straight three, state step three in Cheryl for this particular unique situation in Oklahoma. Might not apply, apply it in, in, uh, in Nebraska uh, or in South Dakota, but boy, Oklahoma was so different. Uh, the step three, uh, and we actually called it the high watermark of step three evidence. And so, uh, taking that, um, taking that cue from the state of Oklahoma and its opening brief to the Supreme Court, after a page of, uh, of jurisdictional statements and throat clearing and so forth, uh, opened with this. A huge, glossy photograph of downtown Tulsa. It said, straight out, straight out of the Step 3 Cheryl paradigm, the decision below would create the largest Indian reservation in America today, which would include Tulsa, Oklahoma's second largest city. That revolutionary result would shock the 1.8 million residents of eastern Oklahoma who had universally understood that they reside on land regulated by the state government, not by tribes. Affirmance would plunge Oklahoma into civil, criminal, criminal and regulatory turmoil and overturn 111 years of Oklahoma history. Now what is that? That's, that's step three. That's all aftermath evidence. That's, that's what are the settled expectations of the non-Indians who live there today? We can't, we can't disrupt those here. Um, so, so they came out of the gate talking step three first. We came out of the gate, as you would expect, talking step one first. Parker, Parker, Parker. Congress, Congress, Congress. And so what, what you had uh, when, when, by the time we were done briefing was two alternative lenses through which to view this case. Our lens was, it's Parker. Only Congress can disestablish a reservation. So you have to ask what Congress did back there when it acted with respect to the Creek Reservation. The state was, Cheryl, step three. Look what's gonna happen. The sky will fall if you call this a reservation. Uh, 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 Indian murderers and rapists uh, and thieves will be roaming the streets because they will challenge their incarceration based on your decision. All hell will break loose if this is an Indian reservation. None of that has anything to do with Congress. So we have the Parker lens and we have the Cheryl or Step 3 lens. And, and not surprisingly, the court uh, revealed itself through its questioning uh, to be polarized. Uh, I should note here that Justice Gorsuch recused himself because of a, a minor involvement uh, in the Murphy matter uh, in many years ago. So we had an eight justice panel. And as uh, as the lawyer for the state was standing up there making her arguments, um, she was all about step three, all about the sky is going to fall. And the first question um, from Justice Sotomayor was a step one question, it's a Parker question. Exactly when did Congress do this? What's the exact date? It wasn't in the statute. Justice Kagan, in 1901, Congress said, we're gonna terminate all sovereignty by 1906. 
But Congress actually changed his mind. Congress, Congress, Congress. Justice Breyer, in 1901, the 1901 uh, in the 1901 Allotment Act, Congress did not eliminate the Greek government. And in the 1906 statute, Congress said the tribal government still continues. Justice Kagan, the question, did Congress, in fact, terminate the reservation? So again, this is a one wing of the court looking at this through a Parker lens. And then, uh, while the lawyer for the state is fielding these kind of questions, the first question from the, uh, the other wing of the court was this. Could you say something about the practical effects of the Tenth Circuit's decision on Eastern Oklahoma? That's step three, that's chill. What, what, what are the people who live there now? How bad will their, will their lives be um, uh, under, uh, under uh, 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 or if a reservation uh, is, continues? Justice Roberts, would this, affirming the 10th Circuit's decision, would this expand the reach of gaming in the area? The consequences, that's a step three question. Justice Kavanaugh, would we be, we would be creating great terminals with the historic practice, the practice of 100 years and the practical implications, shouldn't we just leave well enough alone here? Justice Alito, none of this was asserted by the Creek Nation for 100 years. Acquiescence, that's a shell concept. So we had, uh, we've got a court right now sitting with this decision in equipoise one half of it looking, or at least one side looking uh, through the lens of Parker, and one side looking through the lens of Cheryl. And all of their questioning during the oral argument fell along this divide. And that divide uh, is where it sits. And we had uh, two justices in the middle who did not speak, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Thomas, the author of Cheryl, and the author of Parker. And so I think we have not only a, 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 a divide or, a, or a, 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 a balance of forces here, it's one of very, very great, momentous tension uh, in federal Indian law. And I wish I, I, I had uh, more to say, but that's where it sits with the court. We're now at the mercy of the court, and we wait. A decision is possibly due in uh, May or June. Uh, and uh, we'd be happy to answer whatever questions I can with, uh, with three caveats. One is I don't have a prediction. Uh, two is I, 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 don't, I can't really speak to uh, if the court, if the case comes out favorably, uh, you know, what might the Creek Nation do? Um, differently. Uh, that's, uh, that, those are questions for the tribe itself. Um, and three, if any, any questions are really too difficult, I want to deflect them to uh, Philip Tinker, who's actually the brains behind our firm's uh, handling of this case. So thank you very much.
most of the responses were about uh, the central government and how they continued um, post allotment. But I thought, was there any um, uh, discussion or why wasn't any uh, submission of the historical evidence about um, the acts by all black tribes to petition Congress for the state of Sequoia um, in 1905 as, a, as an act of uh, sovereignty by the national government uh, to exclude Oklahoma and become its own state, and then also post-statehood. Um, in 1937, um, the Department of Interior published a uh, field report of the continued existence of the tribal towns who continued to operate under tri traditional tribal law to the exclusion of non-Indians as well as Indians themselves who uh, didn't fit the uh, traditional elements of being a part of the tribal town. Um, uh, all the way up until 1973. Um, so my, my question was, was that ever reviewed and was it discussed and was it deliberately not included in, in any of the arguments um, or was just this something that uh, wasn't uh, was omitted. Yeah, two 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 responses to that. One is, um, you know, with the page limitations of, of a Supreme Court brief, and and, uh, and the just really in a case like this, the massive massive amount of uh, information you could and you want to put in there, uh, it's some of the most excruciating judgment calls you have to make. Uh, there are arguments that you love that you've been nursing for years have to simply let them go um, because you, you just make these calls. What is this court going to be most affected by? Um, and so a lot of things that were not in our brief, absolutely not a reflection of, of their importance to us. Uh, that, that there, there's calls, strategic calls with respect to um, you know, triangulating between what, what the other side, uh, you know, how strong their arguments are on given issues, what we have to expend our, our mortar fire on. And then, so, uh, so there's that. Uh, the other, uh, in, in the Sequoia uh, history, we definitely dug into that. Um, and that was, was, there was a lot of very beneficial information there, but there was a lot of poison pills. Um, when I say poison pills, I mean statements by tribes uh, and tribal uh, leaders uh, and by Congress uh, that if you pointed the court to a document in, in, those, in those areas, uh, you run the risk of the other side saying, okay, they provided this document, look what Senator so-and-so said right here. Uh, and it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's frustrating because it, it tends to get into a battle of sound bites and what you'd like to do is sit down with the justice and say, let me talk to you about, about the Sequoia efforts. Uh, here's what the tribes did. Here's what it, you just don't get that opportunity to be to, to nuance history like that. Uh, so uh, the Supreme Court is a very brutal place for history. Uh, and, and you have to pare it down to its bare, bare, bare bones. And, and that's painful to do, especially when uh, you're talking about tribal history, which is, uh, you know, it's just not lending itself to bare bones uh, treatment. I hope I answered your question. Question on the back, in the back. I'll go around the operate this microphone. Um, how were the Cheryl questions answered? Uh, well, for two ways. One, uh, you know, we did our best to, to uh, point out that the state uh, and the United States were relying on hyperbole. Uh, you know, when, when, when they say, well, hundreds of murderers are going to be running the streets, you know, I think we did a pretty effective job of, of calling them out on that. Um, and uh, not, not entirely. Uh, you know, you just don't have the time to answer every one of those arguments. Uh, but for example, you know, the United States came out of the gate in this litigation saying, you're going to increase our, our prosecutorial caseload in the Creek Nation uh, by, uh, you know, 50-fold or some, some egregious number. Uh, and, we, and, 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 you know, we kept firing back in our briefing, calling them out, saying there's no support for that. Uh, and here's what the numbers actually look like. And so the United States, in its next brief, pared their number down. In its next brief, they pared the number down more, and in their final brief, they didn't even include it. Uh, so a lot of that was done between within the briefing. Uh, the other thing we did was to say, uh, 
Cheryl uh, doesn't apply here. Look at Parker. See Parker. Cheryl does not apply. What the court said at the end of Parker was Cheryl's valid law. Uh, but Cheryl does not get to the question of whether a reservation exists. Cheryl can be uh, a question, uh, it can be relevant if, say, uh, a, tr a tribe's res reservation is recognized and the tribe wants to do uh, this bit of regulation over non Indian lands or that exertion of authority or some act of sovereignty, uh, then a, 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 a non-Indian could raise a Cheryl claim and say, um, we've got these settled expectations here that the tribe can't do that. You know, if a tribe wants to do something very aggressive and, and, and uh, remove people off their lands or start taxing non-Indian property and so forth, people would raise a Cheryl claim and they wouldn't be dead in the water. Uh, they'd, have, they'd, uh, uh, they'd be able to state a clear claim under Cheryl. But what's, what, what Parker said was that doesn't, that doesn't get to the question, the single question of whether there's a reservation or not. Cheryl is about what can a tribe do inside the borders of its reservation, which was not an issue in Murphy. Remember, the tribe came in from the side as an amicus. It's not, it, it's not a situation where the tribe tried to do something, it asserted its jurisdiction and said, you know, we're going to tax these liquor sales, or we're going to regulate, uh, we're going to zone this land. Uh, and, and somebody challenged that. Uh, that's not what we have here. We have a tribe not making any assertion of jurisdiction. Also, it's a very good case uh, from our perspective in terms of insulating and marginalizing uh, a viable share of defense. So, one more question back. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yes, I was just going to add to what David said, but also in the briefing in the North quite a bit of time educating the court about who the Greek nation are today and what they're doing. As Judge Bigler said, the nation's district courts and law enforcement are prepared to take on the additional jurisdiction, point, right? whatever, whatever should come. There might be some adjustment periods. We've discussed this with the court, but letting the court know about the tribal family violence prevention program, about the tribal hospitals and the healthcare program and that it's not going to become a jurisdictional void should the court recognize the tribe sovereignty over this territory because the tribe is a full service and functioning governmental entity. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, Wilson. Uh, so I get two questions. One is, uh, does it kind of scare you when the justices say they had not read the laws and that they're not uh, Indian law specialists? Does that scare you um, on this case? And also, uh, one justice gave an option of the parties coming together to reach an agreement on how to address the sky's falling uh, uh, issue or question. Has anything happened on that or has that even been discussed between the two uh, parties? Uh, well, the answer to your second question is easy, is I, I just don't, uh, that's, that's out of my lane as, as a litigator for the tribe. Uh, that's the policy making, or, or policy, and, and uh, that, that's, a, uh, that's the job of the tribal government. I'm just not authorized to, to talk about that. Um, as for, does it, does it scare us when the justices, uh, yeah, you don't want them to not have read it. It doesn't scare you, but it's, it's you know, you, you, uh, it's always good when they do if you like your case and you like the documents. Um, uh, but we know that you know the, the clerks for the, the, the justices have read everything. Uh, they're ten times smarter than I am, so I, you know that's a I, somebody behind that bench is, is on the uh, is on it in terms of those documents. And and you know after the case, the justices will get up to speed. So it's not entirely. Uncommon, you know, that, that they won't have everything right. Justice Breyer is what you may be referring to when he said, Look, when I read this statute in 1906, am I going to find in there that Congress said uh, the tribes are preserved? Uh, and I, like you, I was a little surprised by that question, but uh, we knew the answer, and we knew that when he, when he looked in there, he would find it, so that was okay. Um, uh, in, 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 what was the second part of that question? You said, Whether they haven't read it or 
That they're not uh, India Mall specialists? Oh, yes. Uh, that's just the nature of, 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 of India Mall. It's, you know, it's a specialized field, and there's only, you, know, you, know, you always face judges who aren't, uh, aren't well versed in that. And I will say this we were disappointed when Justice Gorsuch uh, uh, recused himself because, you know, whatever one may feel about his jurisprudence in other areas of the law, his 10th Circuit jurisprudence on Indian law is really remarkable. Uh, tribes don't always win, um, but, but I will say that I've never read a Justice Gorsuch 10th Circuit opinion where a tribe either won or lost because he didn't understand the history and he didn't articulate it. Um, this, the, he articulates the history and he does not mince words, whereas a, 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 an ordinary or typical judge might say, you know, the allotment policy was about uh, uh, turning the Indians into farmers and giving them, giving them their own land to assimilate in American society, and they move on. Justice Gorsuch will say the allotment policy was about uh, dispossessing the Indians of their land, uh, piecing them one at a time, and they gave them individual parcels to, to, to facilitate that. Uh, he, frank as can be, it's bracing. Um, and he knows the history. He knows the history, he applies it in the cases. Again, they, they don't always win, but uh, you know, uh, they don't lose based on, on judicial ignorance of history or, or the law, and so we were, we were very disappointed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.